welcome to Human Rights Asia Weekly Roundup. In today's program, we will talk about the increasing authoritarianism in Sri Lanka. Extrajudicial killings continue in Papua. India's corrupt official dom. India's corrupt politicians literally get away with billions. More on that later. Welcome to Human Rights Asia Weekly Roundup. Authoritarianism, which is eroding a fragile democracy, has been on the rise in Sri Lanka ever since Mohinda Rajapaksa assumed the presidency of the country. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Dr. Nevi Pillay, has just returned from a fact-finding mission to Sri Lanka, and she had this to say. I am deeply concerned that Sri Lanka, despite the opportunity provided by the end of the war to construct a new vibrant, all-embracing state, is showing signs of heading in an increasingly authoritarian direction. Earlier, we spoke with Sri Lanka expert Basil Fernando at the Asian Human Rights Commission. Mr. Fernando, can you describe some of the signs of the authoritarianism you have noticed creeping into the Sri Lankan society? At least over 150 years uh, in Sri Lanka, what we have had is a system where law was the king. Uh, despite of the fact that this was introduced during a colonial period, the, the rule, the, the law as the important factor in deciding any, any, anything was established. And uh, to uh, put it into effect, the judges were trained, the lawyers were trained, the people themselves got that idea into their head. But now, uh, during the last 40 years with the introduction of the new uh, constitution, what we are trying to do is to make the king, the president, the law. So, anything can be law. So, the, the, the entire certainty about the law and things being decided by the law, the trust in the court as places where the law will ultimately win, all this is you know very drastically and rapidly disappearing. That is why the uh, statement of the High Commissioner uh, uh, Navi Pillay that there is an increasing authoritarianism is a, is a fact which has been observed by the Asian Human Rights Commission almost on a daily basis making comments about it for at least last 15 years. Can you talk about some of the consequences of this? Well, everything is in chaos. The rule of law takes huge precautions to ensure that police will prevent this kind of thing. Of course, despite of prevention, on rare occasions it can happen. But then there is a complaint mechanism. You go to the police and you complain and then uh, immediately an inquiry begins. The inquiry has enough evidence, the accused will be arrested, he will be brought to a court there will be a trial, he will be given chance to defend himself and at the end, uh, you know, if it is uh, proved, he will be punished. None of these things are happening. So, imagine a society where these things cannot happen. So, people are not protected from crime. See, the essential uh, uh, element of a governance is to make people safe, safe that they can go on their business on their own. They are safe from uh, their own neighbors or, or others doing harm to them and they are safe from government doing harm to them. Now, if that atmosphere is absent, imagine the consequences of all this. Then with that, the uh, 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 violence, uh, people resort to violence as the way to defend themselves because everybody knows the crime does not carry a consequence and the policing system has collapsed. The judicial system has lost uh, 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 respect. So, how do you live in a society like this? This sounds like very worrying signs. What can be done to stop this? The, it is the, the role of the government that matters now. The first is you know to taking steps to bring the law back. So, the measures should be taken to strengthen the, uh, the police so that they have not, they do not have to be worried about politicians and others when they do their work. And the attempt should be given to retrain and to re-strengthen them, give the necessary financial, uh, uh, you know, backing, uh, the resources, above all, the political and the moral uh, backing, saying that you are free to do your work, nobody is going to interfere with this. Same message should go to the judges. 
judges should not feel that if we do something that uh, you know uh, offends the government, we are in going to be in trouble. So, everybody knows th this is uh, uh, nonsense. So, whether there is the will in the, within the government and will within the people to demand this. That was Basil Fernando at the HRC office earlier. The Asian Human Rights Commission has received information regarding the shooting of a Papuan man in Nabire, Papua. The victim, Martin Gobai, was shot in the head during the night of September 5. The identity of the shooter is yet to be confirmed, but there are allegations that the shooting was carried out by the police. According to a local activist who interviewed the family of the victim, Martin Gobai was drunk and escorted to his home by a police officer in the evening of September 5. Later that evening, Martin left the house for the second time despite the warning from the police officer that the police may shoot him if he went outside again. The family was unaware on the whereabouts of Martin until the police informed them on the next day that Martin had died and that his body could be found at Sirwini General Hospital. According to a witness, the police had brought the victim's body to the hospital just after midnight. The family reported that the only injury found on Martin's was a gunshot wound to his head. The request to see an autopsy report was denied as the doctor said that he does not dare to give it without the consent of the police. The HRC has issued an urgent appeal in the matter to pressure police to investigate the fatal shooting thoroughly and bring the perpetrator to justice. Until now, however, the responsible shooter has not been arrested and suspicions that the police are involved are strong. Shootings by the police as well as violence by state agents are reported to be common, not only in Nabire, but also other parts of Papua. In 2010, the HRC released footage of two members of the Indonesian military torturing indigenous Papuans. Other part of the footage shows the cruel and inhuman interrogation of another Papuan man in which the military threatened him with a bayonet and scorched his genitals with a burning stick. The perpetrators were later sent to light punishment of 9 to 12 months imprisonment for disobeying orders by a military court provoking condemnation by human rights group. For our last item this week, we have a guest in the studio. The Executive Director for DHRC, Mr. Bijo Francis. Mr. Francis, welcome. Mr. Francis, there's been a lot of discussions about corruption in politics in India, yet there's hardly any visible change on the ground. Can you please explain the background? The reason why there has been no visible change on the ground uh, while dealing with corruption in India is because for no government so far, dealing with corruption or preventing corruption mm -hmm. has been a policy. So the policy of the state is to not to deal with corruption. So that is the state policy and that is the reason why there is hardly any improvement uh, despite of a lot of talk that is happening about corruption, about the, about the horrendous nature of corruption and, and so on. So without having a state policy on dealing with corruption, we can't expect any change. I see. And why is that there, there are large numbers of politicians in India who are in legislative houses despite having serious um, criminal charges against them? For example, we have uh, some of uh, the notorious characters uh, being uh, facing allegations of corruption. For example, we have A. Raja, who was a former mm -hmm. minister, who has been accused of uh, a large number of uh, 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 money that has been uh, siphoned off from the public exchequer and at the moment as we speak he is, he is in prison. Mm -hmm. He has been charged with uh, 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 different stages and different levels of corruption uh, allegations. But then uh, the time, by the time uh, it, it gets to a stage where the investigation is completed and the trial begins, at the, at the very least a decade would go. Yes. Which means that uh, uh, there would be difficulty in procuring witnesses they would be tampering with evidences because that is possible. There would be change of political conditions which mm -hmm. might even eventually benefit him. So by and large, at the end of the day, when the trial concludes, nobody should be surprised that he being acquitted, despite mm -hmm. the fact that there has been an enormous amount of money which is actually missing from the public exchequer. And it is not just an allegation mm -hmm. by 
an NGO or a media. It is an, it, it is an accusation leveled by another constitutional authority, mm. which is the Controller and Auditor General of India, who has made objection. So that's quite the impartial, the allegation. Yeah, the allegation is impartial. Yeah. The, the figures show that this mm -hmm. person is responsible for uh, having uh, the state lose or mm -hmm. the people lose that much amount of money, millions actually, billions actually. Uh, been lost from the public exchequer, but then at the end of the day, you can't expect a proper trial because the system is such that the uh, that the, that the investigative apparatus is such or it is such maintained that today you can't expect anything else other than protracted, delayed, uh, even uh, 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 corrupted uh, trial, uh, uh, and, and and you can't expect anything else other than these people coming back to power. So the the, the problem that we are dealing with in India is not that. There is no discussion about corruption. There is discussion about corruption. The problem that we are dealing with India is that there is no discussion about the absence of an independent apparatus, the absence of a justice framework, the absence of a rule of law framework, which can actually deal effectively with corruption. So we have out of 530 uh, uh, members of parliament in the central cabinet, uh, central uh, parliament, we have about uh, 120, 150 persons who are accused of very serious crimes. It is just not corruption alone. Corruption sh does not be, should not be uh, viewed as uh, just financial corruption. Mm. Corruption can be at different levels. You know, when, when you have committed, when you are accused of a crime, when, you, when there are witnesses who are willing to depose against you, but then when your trial is not happening because the investigation report has not yet been filed in court, we have candidates who are... Uh, ministers who are members of the parliament, members of the state legislative assemblies, who have been uh, facing uh, investigation for serious crimes like murder, like rape, like, like arson, mm. for the last 22 years. And, mm. and if the investigative apparatus has not been able to file a charge sheet in court, it means that the investigative apparatus is not expected to file that charge sheet in court. So you have a system which is so much badly run mm -hmm. by purpose, mm -hmm. by its own uh, 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 structure, mm -hmm. as it is done today, to make sure that these people who maintain authorities of power would remain in the authority as long as and as much as they want. Yeah. And so in your opinion, what will be the ideal way to address this horrendous problem? I think central to the uh, to this issue is the the scope, the capacity, mm -hmm. uh, the acceptance of uh, of the possibility of an individual to make a complaint if mm -hmm. there is an allegation against A, B, and C, irrespective of the fact that whether that person is a politician or a minister or just an ordinary individual. At the moment, what we have is that complaint making is not encouraged, uh, and 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 the apparatus where these complaints need to be registered are by and large state police. State police is not expected to function the way police as an institution should be allowed to function in a democratic state. It better suits uh, to serve uh, the, the power, the influential people, the powerful and the influential people, uh, the politicians, the, 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 po the policy of the political parties and so on. So as long as we have a policing system which do not encourage making and accepting of complaints, which do not uh, is, is, is incapacitated to investigate crimes, uh, to investigate crimes uh, as it is independently supposed to investigate crimes as it is in the law. And if they are not allowed to do that, and if they are not expected to do that, then we have a problem. Uh, the, the change that is happening, the discussion that is happening, is all about corruption. Mm. But then the, 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 the adjustment, the change, the, the reform that is happening is not at the place where it should actually happen. It should be actually happening at the level of investigative apparatuses on police, on judiciary, on prosecution. But there we don't have any changes. We, we are just gerrymandering the issue. Mm. We are just uh, glossing over the issue. And uh, uh, we, we, we still don't have an establishment, an independent establishment, including the police, which, is actually expect, uh, which, which can actually expect the kind of result that it is supposed to deliver. So we have a lot of discussion, but no result. Thank you very much, Mr. Francis, for your valuable insight on this matter. Thank you very much. That is all for this week, Human Rights Asia Rona. Thank you for joining us and hope to see you again next week. <laughs>